Hello there, this is Crazy John Carrots, and we are on here on OSH Ready along with Pat LaMarche, and she is with uh, Wham Comics. And now you told us also the thing about Wham's is it's also with a uh, a company for nonprofit and stuff, and you said you'd tell us all about that. Yeah, yeah. Wham Comics is part of the Charles Bruce Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that helps writers, artists, and musicians. Wham. So that's where Wham Comics came from, Wham Exclamation Point Comics. Um, and we were 10 years old this year, so we're pretty new. Uh, our role, our, our mission is to advance the artists who create arts. So um, we like to get the arts out for people to enjoy, but our real goal is, especially if you're a small time person, um, it's awful hard to work in the arts and actually eat <laughs> or pay your rent or, you know, be appreciated. And um, that's really nobody's fault because most of the people that use small time new people think, well, you know, I'll get that musician to do it. He's struggling. He'll do it for free. He'll do it for the exposure. Right. But you can't eat exposure and you and you know, I'll get this guy to draw me a few pages of a comic because he wants the exposure and all he can't eat exposure either. So what we do, we do is we most of the money we raise is from the sale of the stuff that we create, mostly books. Um, but we support musicians in their work. We hire musicians to play for other nonprofits so that that nonprofit doesn't have a line item of, you know, I got to pay this band and then I can't make as much money at my nonprofit, at my uh, event. So we'll pay the band so that that nonprofit has a, a music. And so no one expects the band to work for free. Um, and uh, we were doing mostly just novels, YA, kids books, a lot of children's books, a lot of art in the children's books. Uh, and then Jason So, who's a fantastic local artist to me, lives in central Pennsylvania. Um, he contacted me and he wanted to draw a, a comic book and asked me if I would write it. Uh, and the reason he asked me to write it is because I write about poverty. And he wanted a superhero that was homeless. Mm. So I told him. I never wrote a comic book. I love comic books. Um, when I was a kid, we weren't allowed to have them unless the school uh, during the school year. I guess my father thought we'd read more whatever we were supposed to read if we couldn't have a comic. And instead, we just didn't read. <laughs> but but um, so the first day of summer vacation, you know, we'd save up our allowance, run out and buy a whole stack of comic books. Um, but I didn't really know anything about writing a comic book. And I didn't tell him that because I really wanted to. And uh, so what I said was, I'll write it for you if I can make the homeless guy a veteran. Because uh, veterans experiencing homelessness are already our superheroes on the street, right? So I thought it made a nice blend. And then uh, my, I called my brother, who really is a comic book nut. And I said, will you help me write this? because I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, he came up with the idea that the guy's superpower should be invisibility because the homeless are so invisible anyway. So anyway, that was our first venture. Uh, we had Charles Bruce Foundation publish it because of Wham! Writers, Artists, and Musicians. And Wham! The Spaceman is our mascot. My husband's a huge science fiction fan. Um, we, uh, we started Wham! Comics and... Uh, a couple of years ago, we did that first comic. This year, we're going to have two out. Our first one's already published, and our next one's coming out in September. Um, and so we're tiny, tiny little baby steps, but we're starting and we're learning. And you know, if anyone's a comic book fan, they know that the learning curve on comic books is astronomical. You think you know comics, and then you start hanging around with people who do know comics, and you think, oh my god, that comics. yeah. So that's nice. Yeah, I've read some of Jason's stuff. I, I met him. That's how I got here to interview you. And it is nice that you support the music and, and all the arts. And one thing I always say, and you hear it a lot in these, if you go through my interviews, is, you know, people don't realize that when someone is artistic and creative, it covers over into more than one thing, usually. You know, it isn't just, say, you like to write or you like music, sometimes you're, you're also paint or do something else. And 
people don't always realize that it's kind of a way of people expressing. I say it's a, art is a form of expressing your soul and your inner person. So, yeah. you know, and people, a lot of people don't realize that. I thought of something else, too, when you were talking about the writing. It, I, uh, I, I did some work before with Keith Strandberg, who did uh, wrote movies and had movies like No Stranger, No Retreat, which was the first one that uh, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme was in. But he was funny. He said, somebody asked him, he, was a, he went to school for writing and said, hey, would you be interested? And he's like, yeah. And he said, okay, I'll write a script for you. He said, but I had no clue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he said, I wrote something that was 10 times longer than it needed to be. And we had to whittle it down to get the essence. And I could just see that happening with doing a comic book. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, com you're coming at it from the story point of view. And it has to be a blend of the art and the story. Now, I myself, I have to admit, I've seen these comic books where people will say, oh, the art is so terrific. And I'll pick it up and there'd be like almost no story in it. And it's like, I'm sorry, I do like nice art, but I do like a story. And it, it has to be the, a blend of the two to really get the comic across and what the message is. And I do like you said that it was a, the homeless was a, a veteran and his power was invisibility. And that all was making statements right there. Mm. And uh, that that was very good, but it it is interesting how you can overwrite with something like that. Have to balance it. Uh, now, people, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. When I first wrote that, when when we first wrote that first comic for the first dry run, right? So we wrote it for Jason to draw. Um, it was it was at least five times too long. <laughs> and and I can understand the screen. I mean, I call it a script. I now I call it a script. What you write for a comic book is a script because basically what you're doing is your frames are the motion picture, and the words that land in the frames are your script. So that that's what it is in my head. It's a script, right? And it's only the words because the pictures have been drawn. The, the so you've got a screenplay. So I, I have never written a screenplay, but I can imagine. You've got your, your dialogue and you've got your scene, right? The scene is you want to know that the woman's too poor to drive her car. So, you know, she leaves her house, hops on a bike and drives by a car with flat tires, right? Okay, I've told you a lot. She can't afford to get her car fixed. She has to take the bike. You know, all the imagery is done that. Now all she has to do is say, don't forget to feed the cat, right? So yeah. you give the, her very few words because the image has done it all. But I agree with you. If you don't get the don't forget to feed the cat, you haven't learned the what the words can tell you to. So uh, it was an enormous learning curve to to realize I didn't have to say, you know, he ran his hand through his lovely salt and pepper hair. Right. I didn't have to write that because the lovely salt and pepper hair is in the picture. Right. Even his hand being in it is in the picture. So. The artist does so much heavy lifting. And I have written illustrated books before. It's nothing like a comic book because the comic book is the whole story in pictures and or a graphic novel. Whereas an illustrated book is just one image or another image from a chapter. It's not the whole story in pictures. So I would say to anyone who picks up a comic book and thinks the dialogue wasn't much to think again, because it's... I mean, I'm sure drawing one is almost impossible because I couldn't draw anything, but writing them was tough. Well, hopefully it gave you a new perspective and uh, maybe you can reflect on when you write other things. Now, since you are a writer, maybe you could tell us about some of the other things you've written. And, oh, uh, I've, I've written a lot of I, I I'm a journalist. I work for a Philadelphia area newspaper. So my day job is I write stuff all the time. That's basically what happened. Uh, which is really, I think nonfiction is really easy because if it didn't happen, you can't write it. <laughs> How tough is that, right? Um, and sometimes the stories that are real are, are stranger than the ones you can write about too, you know? Right, right, right. And the hardest part I think about being a journalist is getting people to talk to you, right? So if, I, if, if they're going to pass a law that's going to mean that you can't drive Tuesdays at 3 p.m. for whatever reason... I need that senator who's decided you can't drive Tuesdays at 3 p.m. to talk to me. 
And that that's the biggest headache I have. I just want to like bang on a door and say, what's wrong with you? You know, you passed the law. Why don't you talk to the media about it? Um, but I, my, my uh, passion is people who don't have anything. Uh, my mom, my mom's whole family were Irish immigrants. And, you know, you couldn't have a decent plate of mashed potatoes in my mother's house without hearing about somebody who was starving. <laughs> just like, can I just enjoy the potatoes? <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> you know, <laughs> only my mother could ruin a really fabulous bowl of mashed potatoes and butter if I, you know, <laughs> tell you about someone who was starving. Um, but uh, so I, I've just always worked with people and I and I find beauty and kindness in in. Uh, amazingly tragic situations. Um, and so much so that I wrote a book. I, I stayed in homeless shelters all over the country and I wrote a book about it. And a uh, minister in central Pennsylvania read my book and offered me a job. And I ended up running homeless shelters for the better part of a decade. So um, I write a lot about po homelessness and poverty, um, which makes me, you know, no fun at a dinner party. I'm a terrible buzzkill. No one wants me around. So uh, people don't like it when they're eating, trying to eat their mashed potatoes and you talk about that either. <laughs> right, right. But I, I did learn that you don't you talk about You become your mother. No. <laughs> yeah. When the, when the food's good, keep your mouth shut. But yeah, I mean, I go out and speak all the time about it. I travel the country speaking about homelessness. I've probably been in 500 shelters across the country and I've slept at or around or near or on the floor of 100 of them probably. Um but I always have something people can do as an action at the end of one of my talks because and most of my books are about something you can do too, because otherwise you just feel powerless and depressed. Nobody wants to hear you, you know, talk if you're just gonna make them feel powerless and depressed. I have a brand new book coming out that's actually illustrated by a comic book artist, Jer Jeremy Ruby. Um and I've gotten into these comic book artists now so much that, you know, there uh, I've learned so much about that, this amazing art form that even though there's only one picture per chapter for this book I'm doing, the pictures are so cool because it's a comic book artist, right? They they just have more, uh, not more. I mean, my other artists I've worked with have really been great, but there there's shadow where you wouldn't see shadow. And there's, you know, there's just all this real deep dimension to some of their art. Um, but my new book is about food insecurity and how people who have no money and no means actually feed themselves. Um, and inside that book are a whole pile of recipes. So my, my gift to you, if you read this book about how the other half lives is you're going to get the best cherry pie recipe of your life out of it, you know? So, uh, it, I just try to give a little gift back with people take the time to, and an awful lot of the people that. I hear from are going through it. You know, they <laughs> they don't need to learn about it. They're living it. So well, that book might bene be beneficial to almost everybody after they go to the grocery store and look at the prices. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. I've been affected by what we eat. Sometimes we will make, uh, get the ground sausage to make into a uh, dress uh, for spaghetti instead of the hamburger. Because actually it's mm -hmm. nice. It's seasoned and everything and everything. But it's like, a half to third the price of getting the the hamburger. Huh, so I it's like that. it's funny how you can make, you know, you can change and you're not really you're not putting yourself out. It's still good tasting food, but it is more cost effective. Now well, I remember when I was a young man in college, I ate a lot of chicken gizzards because they were cheap. Yeah. And I kid my I kid my girlfriend about that and she's like, no, I don't think so. You know, but I interviewed was, a guy from Ohio whose dad would get free cow brains from the from the local farmer, cow brains, and uh, he'd have scrambled eggs and cow brains on Saturday mornings for breakfast. And he said he didn't know till he was in high school that it was disgusting. Yeah, <laughs> he, he just thought it was delicious. You know, well, I think scrapple is disgusting, and there's lots of people that eat that. So I mean, I'm sure there's brains in the scrapple. <laughs> Probably. But hey, what do you know? Uh, so what? So now we talked about you're you're working with the comics, and uh, what was your education then? Is that what you went to school for? Was writing originally, or what? I always loved writing. Like when my mom died, I found a, a I wrote a book, uh, cleaning the house. I wrote when I was eight, and it was a chapter book. There was a chapter about you know the kitchen, you know, uh, cleaning out the car. Um, 
And, you know, now I, I mean, I can't believe I ever wrote that book because I don't think I would have read it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I've always liked to write. I've liked to tell stories. Um, but I went to college uh, first for mathematics. I like math. I like puzzles. I like stuff like that. Uh, and then I, I got my degree in uh, school and graduate school in history. So I'm, I'm a huge history nut. Um, I Before I ever moved to Pennsylvania, I'd been to Gettysburg eight times. Not, in those days, I lived in Maine, so it was quite a drive. Now I'm a half an hour from Gettysburg. You know, I, did, I never knew that was going to happen. Um, but I really love history. I, what I love is people, right? And the people in history are stagnant. And you can see what happened based on the actions of others. But nobody's being hurt anymore, right? If they were being hurt, they're not being hurt anymore. Um, and so now as a journalist, I write about things, I write about things that aren't painful, but you know, when I write about poverty, a lot of it is. Um, and so that's a little different because all those actors are still going through the trauma of their lives. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I basically, I just did what most people do, which is at least I, I, I never had a plan. Like I went to school because school was was interesting and I graduated from college and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I went into retail um, and I became a high school math teacher, you know, because I was good at math. Um, and then my, my marriage split up. So I had two little tiny kids, a two-year-old and a three-year-old. And I started waiting tables again because the best money you can make fast is, you know, food service. Um, and I waited on a woman who ran a television station. And I was young and skinny and, you know, especially when I have two little kids and no income. And uh, she offered me a job and I spent the next 30 years in broadcast. So I became a television personality and a, turned 35, put on 20 pounds, became a radio personality. <laughs> <laughs> turned 45, put on 20 more pounds, went to print. <laughs> Started working in print. Um, what happens now? I had television shows and huh? I said, what happens next? You know, still in the progression, TV, yeah, yeah, radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 55 and I'm still, you know, I'm past 55 now, but I'm still in print. So maybe there is no, I'm at the basement floor now. Um, but I, I, uh, I just, I've, I've loved the media. I like talking. I like, I mean, I'm enjoying this. I, I enjoy interacting with people and um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, there's nothing I wouldn't try twice probably because you might be wrong the first time. So you did try everything twice. Um, but I'm, I'm not a daredevil, but I am, I'm probably, I don't know. Anyway. So when Jason called and said, do you want to draw a comic book? And I didn't know how, I didn't think that should stop me. There you go. I agree <laughs> with that. I, I think actually thinking about it, your uh, mathematics background probably helps you with your attention to detail and uh, stuff like that but the, the history always interests me because i'm sorry but the older i get i'm realizing the more that understanding history does matter and there's a tv show on i can't think of what it's called it's, it's about when uh after the second world war and uh the black americans were migrating into compton because originally compton was white and the the whites were, you know, reacting back. But this show was also made to be a horror show at the same time. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting to me because I read one of their reviews done by a younger person in their 20s. And they said it was a show about the discrimination about minorities and women in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And I'm like, this show is not that time period. Huh. And then I read another review that said 40s, 50s, 60s. And I'm like, yeah, that's the time period. But the point I'm making is some of these younger people, their connection to the history and when it really happened and how long ago it was is vague. And yeah. to them, 70s, 80s, and 90s seems like a long time ago. But to us, we realize it wasn't. And some of this stuff we went through before, like the, the Me Too and the Woke stuff. I remember... The Mod Squad, uh, Girl <laughs> from Uncle, Julia, yeah. which was a, a, a black female nurse that ha was a single with its son. And then you had, you went from the bionic man to the bionic woman, too. You couldn't just have the bionic man. 
And I think I said the the girl from Uncle. Then I don't know if I mentioned that, but you had that man from Uncle. Then you had to have the girl from Uncle. And we went through this where they tried to update the cultures and what you saw on TV and pushed it on you a lot. We went through that already, but we're kind of going through it again. But the younger people don't realize the time and what happened because they really, I don't know if it's social media or whatever. I think it doesn't give them the depth of understanding of when this stuff happened, Mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And to them, some of this stuff they feel was just yesterday and it wasn't. It was, well, to us, it was yesterday, but to them, yeah. it really was a longer time ago. But that's why history is important, I think. Well, I was born in 1960, right? Which is 15 years after World War II. I was only 15 years from World War II. I'm 63 years from now, right? So, so... Really, when you look at history, when you think of how much closer you were, 1960, I was only 95 years from the Civil War. (laughs) I mean, you do, as you get older, you do have a perspective that young people don't have. Right. And I think what's I think what's also a challenge about remembering history is, um, you know, I remember also the girl from Uncle and the. the bionic woman and all that stuff. But the difference maybe now and then is if, if what was his name? Heath, Heath, Heath. No, that was his name on Bonanza or whatever. Uh, the oh, big, yeah, Valley. Yeah, yeah. big Valley, he was Heath. But the guy who played, uh, if, if he had made a pass at the bionic woman in, in the back room of the, of the, um, of the theater lot or the movie lot, nothing would have happened. People would have expected it. The thing about Me Too is now he's going to jail, <laughs> right? So, True. so the, Me Too, the Me Too movement, I think, and and some of that stuff was more about accountability on how you treat a woman than whether or not you even acknowledge she's in the room, which we would never have had the current accountability if it hadn't been for the fact that they put the woman in the room on the bionic woman, right? But when we lived through it, it was a radical change. So what kids are living through now feels like a radical change to them. But to us, you and me, we remember it happening once before, like you said. That is true. But my, my, my issue, which I was really shocked by, was just not that, but the fact that in their mind, it was the 70s, 80s, 90s. Yeah, yeah. But to them, that seemed, hey, when I was a kid, I'm 63 also. When I was a kid, I still heard all about the Second World War how it changed their lives, how they couldn't have metal and plastic toys, how they went back to being wood. And oh, I would, I still heard about it almost every day, you know? So it's kind of funny. I agree. uh, Yeah. But I I agree too. Things are built on top of things. And we talked about music. And I I always think it's interesting about music too, talking about history. And, you know, like in the uh, late 70s, we had disco and then we had hair metal in in the 80s. But then, and we had a lot of revolt, revolt type music, hippie music, but it was kind of revolting, revolting not as in sickening, but as in they were trying to revolt. They were trying to make a statement a back in the 60s, early 70s. And then in the 90s, all of a sudden you got this grunge music and the kids were just depressed about life and oh my God. And for a while I'm like, what are they depressed about? <laughs> But but here's the thing is, these kids were probably born during the disco hair metal times. To them, they didn't go through Vietnam and and minorities getting rights and women's getting getting more rights. They didn't live through that. And I feel think looking back, disco and hair metal was actually because all of a sudden people's lives were actually better and they were kind of celebrating. And they had crazy music, sort of like the flappers when the flappers came out in the old days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But now you come to the 90s and these kids in their te- late teens or mid teens starting to make music are depressed, but they didn't know what went before them. So they didn't have the same. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just interesting how that happens. And I'm kind of off on a roll there. 
Well, you know, it's interesting too, and that and that's true of the '90s. But the other thing that's interesting about the '90s is that '90s are thirty years ago now. <laughs> right? So, no, it isn't. That was just yesterday. What are you talking about? <laughs> so all of this stuff is getting built on top of all. You know, it's really amazing. It's really amazing. It is, and it's it becomes a percept perception thing. And I was talking to I still have a part time job, and I was talking to someone uh, from Puerto Rico. And he was saying how it's changing down there, too, because the old government is is dying off and it's being replaced by a younger government. And he believes that they are going to become a state. And I said, well, that's a I, I knew Puerto Rico always played the best of both worlds. And he's like, yeah, but the younger people don't really understand the concept of the best of both worlds because now they've always been a territory of the United States in their eyes and that's interesting too how that can affect different parts and he's probably right puerto, puerto rico will probably become a state uh mm -hmm. but that's interesting too and the perception and how even the politics changes and stuff based on that but i'm sorry it took us on a diversion there <laughs> i think i think mathematics and history actually can blend better than people realize it can that's kind of where i was going with that but uh well, so, you know, you can bring it back to comic books, though, because <laughs> I think always bring it back to comic books. <laughs> I think that's the point of Captain America, right? That like, is true. Captain America isn't just uh, that patriotism of the of World War II and everything. It's also the time travel of World War II. It's this the fact that this guy from that era is in the future with all these other superheroes who are definitely technologically advanced and everything else uh but he's still pulling forward that legacy of of strength and patriotism and all that stuff that was so necessary during world war ii the other thing i think that's interesting and i you, you may you reminded me of it when you said it about people don't know what we know because they didn't live through it i'm paraphrasing for you but people no say to me all the time the country's more divided than it's ever been ever and as a historian, I say, have you heard of the Civil War? <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly is when I was a kid, everybody was getting shot. Martin Luther King Jr., Bobby Kennedy, John Kennedy, George Wallace, then the Ford, Ford got shot twice or shot at twice, right? I mean, th this country was so divided th that our leaders were being murdered regularly <laughs> no, not That's occasionally regularly and we have struggled as a country to live to up to our dream and again i could pull this to a comic book i think that's why fantasy comic books are so much fun because we hit the dream so often in a, in in those comics we get we get there you know um it's not post apocalypse zombie it's, hey, guess what? The good guys win, the bad guys lose. That's the dream. That's what we want to be when we grow up as a country. Um, and we got to overcome all those decades and hundreds of years of doing the wrong thing sometimes, maybe most of the time. It is interesting you brought up Captain America because they have played, changed Captain America now. Uh, but Captain America is another one of those subjects that was altered in the late 60s because of racism and stuff. And uh, back then he was given the Falcon as his sidekick, who was a black man with wings, who is actually now Captain America. He is actually oh. now Captain America. So they have been tweaking Captain America. But again, I think some of that comes back to he doesn't hit the same notes he did before. Like you said about him, yes, I'm aware that's what Captain America is about. He's about bringing the old uh, uh, patriotism kind of into the present. And he does things because he thinks this is how America should be. But now that's being retweaked also. And like you said, how many years are we now from the Second World War? I mean, it's a long time now. So now, you know, there was a time when the baby boomers were the major age group. We are not in we're we're losing that status and with us goes some of these views and stuff and it's 
It's interesting. I, I also feel, I don't know what your grandparents were like. I feel like I'm becoming my grandfather sometimes. <laughs> I, I see some of this stuff and I'm like, oh my God. Get off uh, my lawn. <laughs> uh, and and it, it is funny. It's, it's, it, well, it's funny in a, I don't know if it's a good way, but all the new generations, I guess, have to make their mistakes, just like your kids have to make their mistakes. Uh, we made our mistakes. Right, right. You don't want to listen to your adult, your, to your adult figures or anything. My favorite was when they said high school was some of the best years of your life. And you're like, ha, ah, ah. ha. And then afterwards, you're in college or something else. You're working and you're like, they were right. I'd rather be back in high school. You know, so it is yeah. funny how that happens. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's people that didn't have a good time at that age, but it yeah. wasn't a bad time. And, you know, there's other parts of your life that seem to fade away. That's like, I think there was 10 years, a, a definite 10 years of my life that was kind of gone because you did a lot of child rearing. You did other things, but a lot of your time was engulfed and used in child rearing. And that, took a time period away where there's some things that happened during that time that you weren't as aware of as you should have been just because you were busy and busy exhausted. raising and exhausted. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But it is yeah. interesting how that plays. And I'm sorry, we took it away from, yeah, everything can come back to comic books. Uh, I like when they say graphic novels because they can tell a lot of stories and, and uh, you know, they talk about the parallel universes and stuff and the other worlds. And that's always a nice way of teaching history in a kind of different way. You say, well, this isn't what really happened in history. This happened. But what if this one thing changed? And yeah. then you can look at it and go, oh, that might have happened. But that is such a trend right now, too. I'm a huge um, Star Trek fan, like stupid, really huge Star Trek fan. And a lot of the new iterations of Star Trek, you know, all the new series that have come out and everything, they, I mean, even um, Strange New Worlds, right, is basically just an alternate universe of the Captain Kirk story, right? The original well, show. Well, they're not sure about that. They argue that where now they've brought it back into the canon and... Uh, uh, well, whatever. Well, um, whatever. I mean, it's, yeah. all to, it's all up to the fans, right, too, if whatever they enjoy, I suppose, but... I've loved all of them, but it seems like lately um, all of the Star Treks and other things and, you know, I can't even keep up with all the iterations of Star Wars anymore. Even though I'm not, I'm a Star Wars fan, but not as big as Star Trek. Um, but a lot of it is time travel or either time travel, going back and changing something so it turns out differently, um, or it's just the alternate universe, the, you know, the the good guys become the bad guys, the bad guys become the good guys. You know, the whole idea that that uh, that butterfly beating its wing is going to change everything. You know? effect, right? One little thing can change everything onward. I That is interesting. I do. I do like that. Uh, it makes you think. And I do like I do like the strange new worlds, especially. I like that cast. And the fact yeah, me that too. I love Gregory Peck's grandson. He's Spock. He's great. Yeah, yeah, I do like him too. And I, it's interesting to think about the possibility that at any moment you make a decision and it could be a branched universe, you know, and, and that is scientifically a possibility. And uh, I have to admit one of the classes I had re within the last number of years on, a, on studying space and planets and everything, and the guy said, the professor said, you know, these are what we believe to be the rules of nature and how things act. He says, but we're not even sure if in the fringes of our own universe, if everything follows the same rules, mm -hmm. it might not. And that's kind of interesting to think about, too, where you have, you know, I, I think it's a mistake that people automatically assume just because you love science that you become an atheist and you don't think of anything higher or or more complex up above you. And I always think that's a misconception too. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that, you know, I always hate that. It's, it's an easy way to characterize somebody, but I don't think anybody's that easy a character. I mean, yeah. sometimes you simplify a character because you need a good guy, bad guy. But in real life, I don't think it's always that easy, you know? Yeah, but, I think 
that is the the well i i mean this is probably the weirdest tangent you'll ever have on your show but uh i i kind of think probably that's not. <laughs> i kind of think that's what the wizard of oz did right the wizard of oz uh in her dream the guys she knows hank and all the guys she knows and the peddler who's selling things he becomes the wizard right all these ordinary people in her life, everyday life in her dream become these extraordinary characters. You know, one of the guys becomes a cowardly lion and another guy becomes the Tin Man. And all of these extraordinary characters out of out of nobody's, quote unquote, nobody's, right? Um, and, the, and the most fascinating is the, the peddler she met who becomes this all-powerful guy who's just a lying huckster who's you know, he's manipulating her and everybody else to- He's a politician. Power. Yeah, it's, it's just, the book's amazing, but it's written off as a kid's story, you know? I'm upset, Pat. You just wrecked the story for me. I didn't think- <laughs> See, you know, that's you know, a buzzkill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, I thought she actually went to another universe, Pat. Now you're telling me it was a dream. Now I'm going to wreck your mashed potatoes. <laughs> you gotta wreck my best potatoes. Oh, but uh, well, I tell you what, Pat. I try not to keep people too long because I know people's attention span. Not you being interviewed, but the people listening to it is always more limited than it should be. But I understand that myself. Well, always well, talking about you. something. That's right. I appreciate you. But uh, yeah, and this was fun. It was fun. I enjoyed it very much, and uh, I gladly uh, have you back again. What I'd like you to do so I can do it for the people listening is send me some links uh, and I will put it down below, like they say, uh, okay. about about Wham, about your novels and and about anything you'd like to know about the foundation. And I'd like to put it there for people to find out about it. It was a great talk. And I I think, you know, like I said, I think the, the mixture between history and mathematics is great. I'm you know, I have chemistry degree, a computer degree, two engineering degrees, and then a religious wow. degree. So, wow. you know, I got, I think it's fun to learn different things. And, uh, you know, you got your mathematics, which you taught with, you know, in history, history is one of those degrees you say, what are they going to do with it? Well, you could have taught it, you could have worked at a museum, yeah. but you know, it's, it's, it's good to diversify. And, and, uh, and it's not necessarily diversifying. It's like, when you have an, a mind that's interested in learning things and understanding it, again, like being artistic, it just doesn't go one way always. It, it goes into many things and, you know, it adds to you. But I'm on another tangent, so. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in ending, Pat, what would you like to say? I just I had a blast. Um, I will send you uh, links to my stories. I have a brand new book coming out about six weeks the 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 food book will be a little later but um it would might be the story that your fans would like the most but it's uh it's about um it's science fiction it's about a mad scientist who turns his vacuuming robot into a, his best friend he gives it enhanced ai and uh he they together you hear they, that, Loki? You hear that down <laughs> there? my my uh you got your vacuum cleaner there we 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 named him Loki. Oh, oh back nice. in, you know, I don't know if you could see it there. It's kind of yeah. fading in and out. Yeah, there he is. We named him Loki for the god of mischief, you know. That's right. When he goes down the stairs, you know it. Um, <laughs> but but uh, anyway, the, together they invent a magic cat. They genetically modify a cat to make your wishes come true. And uh, and this cat cures homelessness. And the story was written by my grandson. He just dictated it to me. And what? it's whack job, crazy fun. It it was number two last year in the nation for science fiction fantasy for young people. So uh, the sequel is coming out in about a month. So I'll put, I guess I need a link to that. It's called Cursed Kids. I don't know what, now that I've uh, talked to Loki, he's running around now and he's oh. <laughs> not. So see, maybe he secretly is my friend that I didn't know about. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Pat, and uh, I will get those links up and uh, hope to talk to you again in the future. I tell you what, we'll try and talk after you have some of your books out, and That's we'll talk about how they're doing and have you show them to us on, on the interview. And uh, 
hopefully before then I'll get to talk to Jason also do an interview with Jason. Jason's so, wonderful. Great. Yeah, I liked him uh, off the bat when I met him and me and him joked. He knows another friend of mine that does comic book work that was in the Harrisburg area and now he's up in uh, in New York. So, well, thank you, Pat. And mm -hmm. I look forward to talking again and wish you the best in all your books. And uh, I'm going to look you up oh, and uh, probably get a few. Thank you. Oh.